Have you ever thought to yourself, man, I wonder what happened to Subaru, Rim, and Amelia after the end of ReZero Season 2? If you didn't know, the anime covered the first 15 volumes, leaving us with 21 more books of unanimated story. Today we'll begin with Volume 16, but fair warning, the end of this book might be the creepiest slash darkest death loop we've seen so far. <laughs> Roughly a year after the end of Season 2, Subaru tumbles across the ground, satisfied upon completing the obstacle course he and Garfield built. He's very proud of how much muscle he's gained, though his partner wonders if that was a joke. Apparently, this obstacle course was Clint's idea, and Beatrice complains Subaru won't allow her to speak to him. Being pulled into his lap for head pats, Subaru explains he doesn't allow Petra or Amelia to speak with Clint either. They're then interrupted by Petra, as some unexpected guests just arrive to the manor. Entering inside the newly rebuilt mansion, Subaru is swiftly assaulted by one of his former allies from the White Whale Hunt. Next, Mimi attacks Beatrice's curly hair, and Subaru chooses to just watch as if Betty was their child. Making their way to the reception hall, the group is rudely greeted by Rom, who claims she was forced to leave the meeting to search for Mimi. Calling her bluff, it's revealed the discussion has been extremely awkward, even pushing Otto to the verge of panicking. Upon entering, Amelia introduces her knight. Subaru swoons at her words, so Beatrice snaps him back to reality. You come to find out this pretty boy is Joshua Juculius, a knight attending to their rival, Anastasia Hoshin, and the younger brother of Julius, aka the knight who beat the shit out of Subaru. Beatrice sits on Subaru's lap and is thus introduced as his contracted great spirit. Joshua is surprised, since he thought his older brother was the only spirit knight within the kingdom, which then segues into a lecture about the unmatched greatness that is his older brother Julius. This fanaticism is the reason Rom originally left the room, though Amelia skillfully steers the conversation back on track. On behalf of Lady Anastasia, Joshua gives Amelia an invitation to the Watergate city, Pristella. Otto immediately needs to know why they're being invited, and it's revealed Anastasia has found what Amelia is looking for. Instantly taking the bait, she asks what that is, and finds out they've come across a crystal capable of summoning a great spirit. Later that same evening, Amelia feels bad for taking the bait so easily, though Subaru believes she made the correct choice. They briefly discuss how Mimi seemed overly intrigued by Garfield, followed by Subaru discovering that Pristella is essentially this world's version of Venice. Amelia would like to believe this invite was simply out of goodwill, causing Subaru to remind her that each royal selection candidate is, well, unique. I mean, Krush is currently dealing with memory loss, Felt is extremely crafty, Priscilla is beyond irrational, and Anastasia literally has her own private army. Not to mention, how did Anastasia even know they were looking for a magic crystal? At the very least, Subaru hopes they don't run into the final demon beast, prompting Amelia to hesitantly agree. Then bringing this long conversation to an end, they both agree it's best to accept Anastasia's invitation. A few moments later, a drunk Otto complains he just wants what's best for everyone. Subaru apologizes for accepting the invitation so easily, as Otto whimpers they already took the bait. Next they discuss Prestella, and Otto declares he's definitely joining them since nobody else can be trusted with negotiations. On top of that, Prestella is an important city to merchants. Subaru thought he gave up that life, but apparently he plans to return to it someday. Then just before bed, Subaru finishes his nightly routine by talking to Rim. Everyone gathers in Roswell's study to discuss the current situation. Due to his efforts, Amelia is slowly gaining support, though she's unable to attend the upcoming assembly. Federica and Petra will be accompanying Roswell to this gathering, which causes Subaru to worry due to Clint being in attendance. Rom will stay behind to take care of the mansion, while Amelia, Otto, Garfield, and Subaru travel to Pristella. It's then announced that Betty will join them for protection, causing the eavesdropper to state that's obviously what she planned. During the very long journey, Otto and Amelia discuss the standings of the royal selection battle. Due to Subaru's victory over the White Whale and Witch Cult, Amelia has been steadily gaining support. Priscilla has successfully united the southern regions, while Anastasia is backed by the powerful Hoshin Company. Then Felt has been utilizing talented commoners to successfully reform the Astra Domain, aka Reinhardt's family territory. While the only person to actually lose standing is Krush, which is mainly due to her recent memory loss. The unexpectedness of this invite still worries Otto, causing Amelia to apologize once again for accepting so quickly. He's not upset, but instead encourages Amelia to rely on her allies more frequently. 
After 12 long days of travel, they arrived to the Watergate city of Prestella, located at the border of Lugunica and Kararagi. Everyone is stunned at the gorgeous view of the canals, which are the primary source of transportation within the city. Arriving at their destination, Otto asks them to wait outside as he stables the dragon carriage. This inn has very unique architecture, which Subaru notices to clearly be Japanese. Anastasia explains it's named the Water Raiment, causing Subaru to feel as though they walked into another trap. But Amelia responds naturally. The mention of Julius causes Subaru's face to distort, allowing the ladies to share a laugh. Somewhat rudely, Garfield points out that Anastasia is an enemy, so he sees no point in becoming too friendly, just as Mimi burst out the door, dragging Garfield inside. Otto explains this Kararagi style is known as Japanese construction and was created by the hero Hoshin, forcing Subaru to assume Hoshin must have been an otherworlder just like he and Al. Accompanying Anastasia, Julia says it's been a while, Sir Subaru, but is immediately told to drop the formalities. Now, Julius wasn't expecting to find a great spirit here, and Beatrice warns him not to get carried away, even though his mere presence makes her heart flutter, which is explained to be due to his natural blessing of spirit attraction. With Otto taking the lead, the conversation turns serious, as he wishes to know why they were invited. Their host claims she just wants to get to know each other, and that isn't it normal to prepare a gift for your guests? The real mystery is, how did Anastasia know what they were searching for? However, that information is kept secret, but she does reveal that a local merchant is currently in possession of the crystal they seek. This upstanding merchant does have a normal name, but he's more commonly known as the Songstress Maniac. Outside a bit later, Subaru learns the Songstress and her Songstress Maniac are both famous all around Prestella. Julius does however urge him to guard Beatrice, causing Subaru to exclaim the Songstress Maniac is a lollicon. The younger brother Joshua then arrives, with a dragon boat prepared for their trip. His openly rude attitude earns him a brotherly scolding. Just before Garfield erupts, they all abandoned him. Apparently, Mimi's little brothers have been relentlessly attacking him, solely due to his close proximity with their big sister. Sister. Then with the girl's arrival, they can depart on the ferry, and Subaru finally notices that some of the canals are seemingly flowing uphill. That's due to the four Meteor Towers, aka Magic Towers, at the edge of the city which control the water. Subaru then suddenly discovers that he gets seasick. While resting on a side street, he's comforted by Beatrice, as Amelia had to leave him behind in order to make their appointment. It's once he begins to feel better that Beatrice takes the lead, guiding them through the streets, allowing Subaru to ponder the songstress, and recall the time a wandering musician named Liliana stopped by the mansion. Our duo then finds themselves at the edge of a park, as Subaru finally realizes Beatrice has no idea where they're going. She refuses to confirm his suspicions, and they notice an enchanting melody in the air, which leads them to a crowd of people. Loudly proclaiming it's happy, but so sad, interrupts the songstress, as the crowd swiftly transform into a mob running off Subaru. A few moments later, after the crowd has left, Subaru steps forward to apologize. He's cut off by a song. Unexpectedly, Subaru joins in, as you learn this songstress is in fact Liliana, the same traveling musician he met before. They're each glad to find the other is doing well, followed by Subaru bringing up the songstress maniac. His expression then drops, as it's revealed to be Mr. Kirataka, a man they previously knew as Liliana's stalker. FYI, some characters, like Mr. Kiritaka, don't have a usable character model. In those instances, I'll substitute in another character model to represent them. Anyways, she's just excited to meet the Moppet Mage once again, and begins rattling off their numerous accomplishments. Betty basks in the praise, all the while Subaru states he's not done enough to be considered a hero. Only after he's become a real hero will he allow Liliana to write a song about him, causing her to shake with excitement about one day singing the tale of the Moppet Mage. After a bit more discussion, Liliana offers to show them to their destination and to even put in a good word for them. Beatrice thinks it's a bad idea to rely on her, but Subaru ends up accepting her help as he wants to seem useful after falling sick on the boat. Immediately upon entering the Muse Company, the receptionist attempts to shoo Liliana away, though with Subaru backing her, they make their way to the meeting room. Now they just have to wait for the perfect moment to intercede. Liliana bursts inside, exclaiming she's upset that Mr. Kirataka was hiding the fact her friends are here. The songstress maniac fails to calm her, just as Liliana lies, claiming the Moppet Mage will allow her to sing his tale if this crystal deal is a success. Swiftly regretting his choices, Subaru picks up Liliana, apologizing for the intrusion. And in response, Mr. Kirataka frantically screams, Don't touch her! Throwing a magic exploding crystal. 
With Kiritaka gone, Dionys apologizes for his master and persuades Liliana to go calm him down. Our group is then left alone. Otto rages, asking what the heck was that? Well, Subaru was just trying to help, but apparently the negotiations were proceeding flawlessly before his interruption. Well, what's done is done, so the group will head back to the water raiment, except for Otto, who apparently has some merchant-related business. Though on the way back, Amelia accidentally bumps into a passing stranger. This white-haired man states he once attempted to marry a beautiful girl just like her, prompting Subaru to end that conversation. Then after walking away, Subaru looks back to find that strange man staring directly at them. Back at the inn, a rough-looking man is demanding to see Anastasia, but of course Joshua isn't going to allow that. Tensions continue to rise, prompting Amelia to cut in, demanding a proper explanation. This guy claims to have an official invite, but Joshua deems him an obvious liar. Unsure how to proceed, Amelia looks toward her knight, who realizes and exclaims, it's Larry! The man angrily corrects him, as Subaru explains how he's met this guy a few times before. Beatrice realizes he's not a good guy. Lacken stutters in panic, and Garfield is told to restrain him. However, Garfield's focus is elsewhere, with his hair standing on end. A massive pressure then sweeps over the area. Garfield immediately attacks an oncoming stranger. Effortlessly catching the beastly arm, Reinhardt apologizes and looks towards Subaru saying it's been a while. After introducing himself, Reinhardt offers a handshake to his attacker, which Garfield instinctively backs away from. He apologizes for the offense, and they move on to discussing how Lackens, alongside his two friends, is an official retainer for Lady Felt. With this revelation, Lackens demands an apology, only to be scolded by Reinhardt instead. They're surprised that Lady Felt was invited here as well, and wonder if any more surprises await them. Reinhardt then orders Lackens to return to Felt, though if anyone needs him, all they have to do is call. Our group then heads inside, with Reinhardt asking Subaru for details on the White Whale Hunt. It's upon entering the tea room that everyone is shocked to find Reinhardt's grandfather, Wilhelm, waiting there. Due to the previous encounter, Garfield is extremely gloomy, but Mimi is still attached to his hip. Lady Kruse states it's been a while, followed by Subaru apologizing to Ferris for overusing his magic gate. Now it's a genuine coincidence that everyone arrived at the same time, but Subaru notices that Wilhelm and Reinhard won't even look toward each other. Amelia once again asks why they were invited, and is told it's just to get to know one another, though one candidate was purposely left out. Of course, Anastasia prepared gifts for everyone, and Subaru jumps up upon learning Lady Kruse was promised information regarding the Archbishop of Gluttony. Luckily, she's happy to share any info she obtains. Granted, she's planning to kill Gluttony before anyone else even gets close. A young girl then crashes the conversation, causing Reinhardt to freak out since Felt changed back into street clothes as soon as he left her. Lady Felt then addresses the room, giving an extremely polite and proper greeting. With everyone acquainted, the girls head to the bath as Garfield chooses to take a walk outside. Subaru tries reassuring his friend that he's strong, but Garfield simply states not strong enough. Then it's that same night, after tucking his partner into bed, Subaru takes a walk to the garden. Outside, he's greeted by a friend, and after a moment, the conversation turns toward Wilhelm's late wife, the sword saint Teresa von Astria. As a final act of love, Wilhelm plans to die someday with his sword in hand, but winds up being scolded by Subaru for such talk. Countering, Wilhelm states it's dangerous to prioritize others over yourself, and declares that Subaru holds more power than he even realizes. With a lull in the conversation, Wilhelm tries to take his leave, but Subaru apologizes before asking what's the issue between him and Reinhard. The distance between him and his grandson is one of Wilhelm's three regrets, and he fears Reinhard truly hates him. From Subaru's perspective, he believes Reinhard also wants to fix the relationship, so Wilhelm might as well go apologize. There's always the chance Reinhard won't forgive him, though Subaru states he just has to apologize again and again until it's accepted. This simple-minded plan leaves Wilhelm speechless, and Subaru informs him that Reinhard was asking about their battle against the White Whale. The following morning in the garden, our group briefly discusses Garfield before working out the plans for today. Apparently Otto has another meeting with Mr. Kiritaka. While that's going on, Subaru wants to escort Amelia to the park. She thinks it's her duty to accompany Otto, but is told it'd be best for her not to accompany him today. Lady Felt then comes outside, where Subaru introduces Otto as their Larry. Reinhardt is then brought up, as Felt explains her knight is almost always a pain in the ass, and that he arrives in an instant if she calls for him. A second later, Reinhardt arrives, causing Felt to exclaim she didn't summon him. Moving inside for breakfast, you find out that Mimi and Garfield have both been missing since last night. 
Large black griddles are then placed in front of them, causing Subaru to realize they're having okonomi okono ok okonomiyaki, aka Japanese pancakes. Now, Amelia and Betty both offer Subaru their cooking, but after a quick glance, he suggests they taste test it themselves. Of course, Reinhardt's cooking is flawless and being consumed by felt. All the while, the overconfident Anastasia burns hers to a crisp. Like a good knight, Ferris is serving his lady, though beside them, Wilhelm is seriously struggling. The group then discusses Subaru's many accomplishments, causing Wilhelm and Julius to both hype him up even further, followed by Amelia and Beatrice laying on the praise. The lighthearted conversation is then interrupted, by a loud voice being broadcast across the entire city. Apparently, this is a daily occurrence, only made possible thanks to Amitia. It's ran and owned by Mr. Kiritaka, and the broadcast ends with an unbelievably enchanting song from Liliana. Though today, she chooses to sing the love tale of the sword devil. The entire room listens silently, well aware of the emotions Wilhelm must be feeling. Though afterwards, this old man nods to Subaru, before turning to his grandson. Reinhard boldly faces him head on, as Wilhelm stutters, asking for help with cooking. With a genuine smile from ear to ear, Reinhard happily begins assisting his grandfather. Bursting through the door, reeking of alcohol, a red-haired middle-aged man exclaims their relationship can't be patched up so easily. Enraged, Subaru tells this guy off, causing the man to order the knight's present to kill Subaru. However, Julius declares everyone here is on special duty, and as such, don't have to follow the vice captain's order. This man is then introduced as Vice Captain Heinkel Austria the Idol, aka Reinhardt's father. Wilhelm attempts to reprimand his horribly rude son, but Heinkel counters, asking why he wasn't invited to the White Whale celebration. He also wonders if Reinhardt thanked his grandfather for avenging his grandmother, whom he let die. Subaru can only assume this asshole is spouting lies, however Wilhelm nor Reinhardt are denying any of it. Stepping in between them, Amelia demands to know why Heinkel is here. Insulting her as a half-demon, he's cut off, as she forces him to answer the question. As he retreats from this little girl, the other candidates prod him even further, followed by Julius suggesting it'd be wise of him to leave. An arrogant voice slices through the tension, as an unbelievably attractive woman steps through the door. This is, of course, the final royal selection candidate, Priscilla Bariel, the woman whom Anastasia purposely chose not to invite. Priscilla is curious why they're not bowing before her. Subaru states that's dictator-like behavior, as she asks who let an unknown peasant inside. Her knight Al, who is an otherworlder just like Subaru, attempts but fails to remind her who Subaru is. With an apology, Al suggests Subaru raise his affinity a bit more, though he bites back telling Al to try raising his speech instead. Vice Captain says she's late, but receives a death threat for not using her proper title. You find out she brought Heinkel mainly because she thought it'd be entertaining Plus, she couldn't allow such a pitiful reconciliation. Anastasia wants to know how Priscilla knew of this get-together, and is essentially told Priscilla keeps a close eye on all of them. Felt then brings up her knight Reinhard, and how his family inheritance is her lifeline in this royal selection. Though of course, Heinkel has no intention of handing over the inheritance to his son. Reinhard attempts to speak up, but Felt cuts him off, ordering him to put on his war face. Heinkel declares he will give everything to Priscilla. Said lady interrupts, as the filthy commoner dares to reprimand her. Being slammed into the ground, Heinkel was immediately kicked back up. A split second later, the Crimson Sword is stopped by Al, one moment before Heinkel would have died. Receiving a punch to his stomach for daring to touch her, she admits Al did make the right call, so as a reward, she'll allow him to lick her foot later. Her attendant Schultz drags Heinkel away, earning him a future reward as well. Al begs her to give Schultz a different reward than his, and she agrees to cuddling Schultz while he sleeps. Felt needs to know if Heinkel was serious about not giving Reinhardt the inheritance. Priscilla asks if Felt is going to cry about it, but young Felt declares she'll just order Reinhardt to take it by force. This bold statement is accepted, and Priscilla reminds them the civilians support Felt, so a document of who's in charge doesn't really matter. The lovely Priscilla then takes her leave, asking everyone to please make this an enjoyable battle. A few moments later, back in the garden, Julius thanks Subaru for getting angry at Heinkel. Subaru, however, isn't proud about losing his cool, but is told his display of rage actually helped everyone else stay calm in that scenario. Julius wanted to do exactly what Subaru did, and bows to his fellow knight as a thank you. Next, they discuss how Wilhelm used to be captain of the Royal Guard. During this time, a royal child was kidnapped, 
so it was Wilhelm's job to lead the investigation. It was while he was busy investigating that the knights launched an attack to slay the white whale, which led to the death of Wilhelm's beloved wife. On top of this, it's rumored that Heinkel was involved in the royal kidnapping, and it was Heinkel himself who ordered his own retired mother to join the expedition. Then, as if it couldn't get any worse, Heinkel was too pitiful to take part in the hunt himself. Subaru simply can't believe such a horrible person could even exist. While heading to the park, Amelia expresses her joy about Subaru and Julius becoming such good friends, though of course he denies it. They discuss Liliana, and Amelia states she doesn't want them trying to use her again for their own benefit. Our knight loves that genuine honesty of hers, but recognizes it's just as much of a strength as it is a weakness. Eventually, they arrive at their destination and find a crowd gathered once again. They make it to the front, just as the performance of the songstress, accompanied by a seductive dancer, comes to an end. To Subaru's surprise, Priscilla thanks the crowd, before warning Subaru to try and keep his lustful eyes off of her. As a counter, he boldly declares his preference to be Amelia. And that's okay, because Priscilla allows her subjects to have poor taste. Our group then notices that Priscilla is alone, though she's more than confident in her ability to protect herself. Lady Priscilla then offers Liliana the wonderful opportunity to come and sing, exclusively for her. After giving it some serious thought, Liliana confidently declines. The air grows unusually tense, as Priscilla wishes to know why Liliana would dare refuse. Though after hearing she's a wandering musician at heart, Priscilla easily accepts and even apologizes for being rude. Our group is shocked she allowed that. Priscilla begins insulting Amelia, so Betty throws shade right back at her. Subaru then openly says he'll never understand Priscilla, prompting her to explain that the whole world is essentially owned by her, and that it's not right to cage every beautiful bird she comes across. After all of this, Liliana finally notices that Amelia's group and Priscilla are not exactly friends. To resolve this, she will sing a song of friendship, and Subaru is forcefully asked to go buy snacks for the group. It's roughly 10 minutes later, while returning with the snacks, that Subaru bumps into his pal Larry. He shouts his name is Lackins, and for Subaru to stop acting as though they're friends. It's then that Subaru realizes the street has come to a standstill, as everyone is looking up at the clock tower. A strange person wrapped in bandages appears, politely asking for everyone's attention, before introducing themselves as the Witch Cult, the Archbishop of Wrath, Sirius Romani Conti. Unexpectedly, this archbishop seems cheerful, but that doesn't stop the crowd from panicking. Subaru also realizes that Wrath used the same surname as Petalgeis, and that it's possible Sirius might have info pertaining to gluttony. A demanding shout silences the crowd, followed by Wrath warning four specific people not to move unless they wish for this area to become a bloodbath. Very politely, Subaru poses a question, wondering how much longer this will take, since there's currently four girls waiting for him. Apologizing profusely, Sirius seems embarrassed to admit she stopped all of them for the purpose of determining love. Everyone present laughs at the ridiculousness, but prompts her to continue. Sirius then drags out a chained up, obviously terrified and panicking child. It's explained that young Luzbel is a native of Prestella, and is being extremely brave today. The crowd encourages the boy not to cry, and begins applauding his courage, just as Luzbel is hoisted into the air. Subaru and Lackins even begin to cry tears of joy as they witness the outstanding heroism that Luzbel is displaying. Thanks to the crowd's help, Sirius now understands that the world truly is a kind place that has no need for wrath, followed by her throwing the boy high into the air. At the sight of this, the crowd, including Subaru, roars with cheers as the boy fights against his restraints while plummeting toward the ground. The inevitable splat is drowned out by shouts of praise, followed by more splats and the world going black. Upon opening his eyes, Subaru is extremely confused, but then drops to his knees upon remembering what just happened. Cameron Wilder, thank you so much for becoming my newest patron.